Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today. I would um, like to echo what Dr. Israelian and Dr. Muthsami had mentioned in terms of saying welcome to our Gastroenterology and Hepatology Symposium. We hope this is an educational and rewarding experience for you for the next two days. So I am a Berkeley alum Ketkai, and I'm here to uh, moderate our morning session on inflammatory bowel diseases. And we, the theme for this year is Beyond the Basics, where we hope to address some, at least some of the more intermediate and advanced topics in the management of IBD, while at the same time not getting too esoteric, where it becomes um, either zebra cases or becomes um, relegated to the IBD sub-sub-specialists. But with that, we are very fortunate to have our uh, esteemed guest faculty. So one is uh, Dr. Maria Abreu. Um, she is a professor of medicine and of microbiology and immunology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. She's also the director of Crohn's and Colitis Center there and the vice chair of research in their department of medicine. Now of note, Dr. Brew is uh, the vice president or president-elect of the American Gastroenterological Association, which means that in but a few months at our upcoming DDW conference, is that right? One more year, you'll have one more year. She will be the president of our National GI Society. So again, we're very uh, honored and fortunate to have her here with us today. As well, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Kian Kiyashian. He is a clinical associate professor of medicine and the clinical director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program at Stanford University School of Medicine. So with both of them, they were very fortunate to have them share with us their expertise from the depth of their research and breadth of their clinical experiences over the past decades. In addition, we have our UCLA faculty. I'm very um, uh, delighted to have Dr. Mary Kwan. She's an associate clinical professor of surgery and a strong collaborator with us in gastroenterology where we uh, care for a lot of patients with IBD. As well as Dr. Jenny Sock, she's our uh, director of clinical care in our Center for Inflammatory for Bowel Diseases and uh, the associate clinical professor of medicine. Here are some of their faculty disclosures. Now, we have pre-vetted these presentations, so these are not found to be relevant to today's presentations. So today, our learning objectives include uh, trying to understand some of the current evidence of diets in IBD, describing the diverse options of advanced therapies, and that is biologic therapies as well as small molecule inhibitors, and the considerations of choosing when and what, when to prescribe. We'll also hope to learn uh, about some approaches uh, for the management of medication-resistant IBD and the important considerations in caring for the elderly as well as those who are pregnant. To achieve that, we've structured this morning's session uh, as follows. So uh, for the first half of the morning, we'll actually focus on uh, therapeutic uh, uh, um, modalities such as diets, biologics, small molecule inhibitors, again, also focusing on those who are medication-resistant. And then after the break, we'll chat a little bit more about special populations, so the individuals who, have, who are elderly um, and or are pregnant. And then to cap off this morning, we have a great debate between uh, Dr. Abreu as well as Kiyashin, uh, where they will discuss the pros and uh, cons of proactive versus reactive therapeutic drug monitoring. It'll be a friendly debate. So Raman already asked these questions, so I'll just skip, on, skip this. So let us begin. We have a 22-year-old uh, graduate student here at UCLA who presented with a three-month history of right lower quadrant abdominal pain and loose, non-bloody stools. She initially attributed her symptoms to stress or food sensitivity, which is not uncommon, but later sought medical attention due to the progressive and persistent worsening of her symptoms. When presenting in clinic, she described her right lower quadrant abdominal pain as uh, cramping and uh, associated with uh, consumption of food, but otherwise has also three to four bowel moons per day, uh, which is increased from her baseline about zero to one bowel moon per day, and having, again, loose, non-bloody stools. Her symptoms were aggravated by the consumption of spicy and fried fatty foods, and uh, fortunately, she did not perceive any significant weight loss. Just to uh, round off some of her past medical history, we see that she's on OCPs, but otherwise no other medications. She doesn't have any significant past medical history, and she endorses occasional alcohol use and no other substance use, and there's no significant GI or autoimmune conditions in her family. On physical examination, she appears to be well-appearing, not much of anything to remark, uh, other than that she had a mild tenderness to palpation in the right lower quadrant. No rebound or guarding or abdominal masses uh, per perceived. 
From the standpoint of diagnostic testing, her laboratory um, evaluation was also fairly unremarkable, except for her stool studies, which showed a calprotectin slightly elevated at 124. And the threshold for normal in this particular lab was at about 50. So to continue her workup, you know, performed a colonoscopy, in which case we found a mild erythema and scattered ulcers in the distal five centimeters of her terminal ileum. Her colon was otherwise normal in appearance. And this was consistent with what was found histologically, where the TI was noted to have moderate chronic ileitis, and the colon had no histologic abnormality. Now, as part of the workup, you also did the upper endoscopy as well as the MR enterography, and both did not find any additional sources of intestinal inflammation. So with this, the patient is now diagnosed with ileal Crohn's disease. She was recommended some uh, medical therapies, but expressed some hesitation in starting immunosuppressive therapies due to fears, particularly of adverse effects or potential adverse effects. She had read on social media, as anybody who would naturally have been diagnosed with um, you know, a new condition, uh, about dietary therapies or the potential for dietary therapies in Crohn's disease, and asked about that as a potential for her treatment. Now, when presented with a patient who feels very strongly about not pursuing immunosuppressive therapy, what will you tell her when he asks, she asks about dietary therapy? On one hand, you know, A, no, there's no role for diet in her case, or B, maybe no, there might be da data, but you would not recommend it. C, maybe yes, there may be some data, but you would not recommend it uh, other than in combination with immunosuppressive therapies, or D, yes, she can consider diet monotherapy. Oh, they should probably not do this in real time, so that way you don't get swayed by other people's responses, right? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we have a, a majority option of C and D, or I guess A changed his or her vote. <laughs> uh, but this is more so to get a tenor or the feel of, the, you know, of your thoughts. Now, these are all anonymous, so don't worry. We're not going to try to track you down and say, why did you choose this or that? So with that in mind, let's discuss at least some of the evidence for diet therapies in IBD. So we know that diet affects disease activity through uh, animal and in vitro studies that have previously been uh, demonstrated. Nutrients may bind different receptors and or interact with intestinal membranes uh, as it amplifies or modulates intestinal inflammation. Diet also shapes the gut microbiome, influences gene expression and epigenetic changes, and directly or indirectly defines the metabolome. Now, this multiome then mediates the myriad of biologic effects that diet has on our bodies. Intestinal inflammation, in turn, provokes gastrointestinal symptoms. But we also know that even in the absence of intestinal inflammation, such as in the disorders of gut-brain interaction, which we will discuss tomorrow um, in tomorrow's session, that diet has also a very strong influence on GI symptoms. And there's this complex network then of the intertwined biologic systems that um, tie diet with health and disease activity. With that biologic underpinning, studies have shown that exclusive enteral nutrition, that is, the exclusive consumption of liquid nutrition formulas, is an effective treatment for Crohn's disease, where medical and nutrition societies now recommend exclusive enteral nutrition as a first-line corticosteroid-sparing therapy for the induction of remission in pediatric Crohn's disease. But as you can imagine, exclusive consumption of a liquid nutrition formula may be challenging to conduct. You know, we, we eat not just for nutritional substance, but also for social reasons, when we're happy and when we're sad, and when we do different activities, like going to watch a movie or while at work or any other activities, right? So what about solid food diets or alternatives to this exclusive ventral nutrition? To answer this question, the International Organization for the Study of Inflammatory Bowel Diseases assembled a group of nutrition experts, one of whom was actually Dr. Abru. And uh, they scoured the research literature to evaluate studies that had uh, looked at the association between different diets or nutrients and uh, inflammation. And I present a tabulated summary of their findings. So we see here one column for Crohn's disease and one column for ulcerative colitis. Depicted in green are those where they encouraged increased consumption, and depicted in red are those where they discouraged consumption. So as you can see here for Crohn's disease, that 
For fruits and vegetables, they actually would recommend an increased consumption of fruits and vegetables for Crohn's disease. Now, very interestingly, we actually don't see that uh, for, on the side for ulcerative colitis. Now, that is not to say that fruits and vegetables are not good for ulcerative colitis. It's just more so reflects a gap in the research literature. And we also then see about red and processed meats where they would actually discourage consumption of that for ulcerative colitis. And what is also consistent for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is you know, discouragement for consumption of unpasteurized dairy, dietary fats, and food additives. But as I alluded to earlier, we note that there are actually quite a number of question marks here. And when the group graded the strength of their evidence, they found that most of them to be either low or very low. Now, this dearth of literature does not mean that there's not value in this table or we can't provide meaningful recommendations to our patients. It's more so that this is the, just the current state of the evidence. You can still extrapolate from this and use that to help kind of guide your patients in what may be helpful or maybe detrimental uh, for their intestinal inflammation. But what about solid food diets? So moving on beyond just like the isolated nutrients, but what about diets as a whole? So we performed a systematic review and meta-analysis, and I actually, this was a multi-center uh, um, kind of group of uh, collaborators who worked on this project, but I just include to the top right are some of the trainees who actually worked on this. We have Gala from the University of Miami, Shaya from here at UCLA, and Mahesh from uh, Johns Hopkins University, who all were you know, valuable contributors in this effort. So this again was a systematic review and meta-analysis of the prospective observational studies and randomized controlled trials where they evaluated comparisons of solid food diet with that of a controlled diet. Now, there are other studies, or many studies actually, that did single arm trials of different dietary interventions. But the importance of actually looking at it with a controlled diet is to be able to then disentangle or glean the benefit or, or lack thereof of the specific intervention versus that of just a natural progression of the condition. So in this, our outcomes of interest included IBD-related gastrointestinal symptoms, inflammatory markers such as the CRP and calprotectin, and endoscopic histologic and imaging data. Out of 8,332 articles we had identified, we glean about 36 for qualitative synthesis and about 27 for quantitative synthesis. So what were some of the findings? For induction of remission, it was found that you know, the specific carbohydrate diet was equivalent to that of the Mediterranean diet and the whole food diet for induction of clinical remission in Crohn's disease. Keep in mind, however, that that particular study that compared a specific carbohydrate diet with the whole food diet only had a sample size of 10. So I think a lot more needs to be done to either confirm or refute that finding. Whereas for the comparison between the specific carbohydrate diet and the Mediterranean diet, that was actually born out of a well-performed study. It was a multi-center study here in the United States led by Dr. Jim Lewis at the University of Pennsylvania uh, called the Dine CD study, where they found that the specific carbohydrate diet and Mediterranean diet were similar in its efficacy of being able to achieve Crohn's disease symptomatic remission at week six, fecal calprotectin response, and CRP response as depicted in this graph over here. Beyond that, we you may recall me mentioning earlier that exclusive enteral nutrition is an effective treatment for Crohn's disease. But you also may recall me mentioning that it's not as uh, simple to follow. So what about the use of partial enteral nutrition? And partial enteral nutrition, that is, as a combination of enteral nutrition with a solid food component. So for this, fortunately, it was found that partial enteral nutrition was roughly similar to exclusive enteral nutrition for the induction of clinical remission in Crohn's disease. Let's dive in a little bit more deeply into the study that, or the data that uh, shows this point. So a study by Levine et al. Uh, had uh, assigned patients to either receiving exclusive enteral nutrition or partial enteral nutrition for six weeks. And for the partial nutrition arm, they use a Crohn's disease exclusion diet as their solid food component. You see in the image to the top left, the top left, yes, top left, that uh, the Crohn's disease exclusion diet included avoidance of animal fats, wheat, dairy, red meat, emulsifiers, maltodextrin, and carrageenan. And conversely, the addition of fruits and vegetables, ah, similar to what the IOIBD uh, found. Now, what they found after six weeks is that the partial nutrition was not surprisingly, more tolerable than exclusive enteral nutrition. And unfortunately, they also found that partial enteral nutrition and exclusive enteral nutrition were similar in its ability to improve symptoms 
and laboratory biomarkers such as CRP and calprotectin. Now these investigators took this a step further by having the patients continue for another six weeks. But this time, instead of staying on the same dietary interventions, what they did is that for those who actually were on exclusive ventral nutrition, they were transitioned to having 75% of their calories uh, via uh, the standard diet. So whatever usual diet they had um, previously. And then those who actually were originally assigned to the partial ventral nutrition arm were then transitioned whereby 75% of their calories were derived now from the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And what they found was that Crohn's disease exclusion diet was superior to the standard diet in uh, being able to uh, maintain remission. And this is from the standpoint of symptoms and also, again, laboratory biomarkers of inflammation, again, CRP and calprotectin. So there are some uh, fortunate glimmers of uh, data to show that there is some uh, benef benefit for Crohn's disease. What about for the maintenance remission in Crohn's disease? So at this point, we've pro we just have prospective observational data, which have shown that those who consume partial nutrition have a lower risk of clinical relapse than those who consume their controlled diets. As for ulcerative colitis, Unfortunately, the data are not as robust as that for Crohn's disease thus far. So in some of the studies we have, uh, we include that um, the symptoms-guided exclusion diet, milk protein elimination, and the gluten-free diet were no different than their control counterparts for the induction or remission in ulcerative colitis. As for the maintenance or remission in ulcerative colitis, uh, unfortunately, it's still the same story at the moment, where the carrageenan-free diet, anti-inflammatory diet, and the milk protein elimination were no different for maintenance of remission or prevention of clinical relapse than their control counterparts. Fortunately, there is yet some glimmer of hope. So hope it. when we actually delve a little bit more deeply into the data, looking particularly at laboratory bioinformarker uh, markers, um, we see that if you were to have a threshold of 150 micrograms of per gram of stool for the fecal calprotectin, that the anti-inflammatory diet was actually favorable or you know, superior to a control diet for having lower calprotectin levels. Again, I don't want to discourage us and say that you know, there is no role for dietary therapy in ulcerative colitis. It is just that this is the state of where the research is and more research is obviously needed. But to take this and from a different approach, we performed an observational controls, uh, cohort study of uh, 691 patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and tried to assess the relationship between their dietary patterns and disease activity. We used an unsupervised machine learning model to reduce or avoid the risk of bias and preconceptions of what is considered maybe healthy versus unhealthy nutrients to identify different dietary patterns. And our model was able to identify five discrete dietary clusters, which we thereafter labeled WD, BD and PB. Now these acronyms stood for like Western diet, balanced diet, and plant-based diet, based really on more so the composition of what these dietary patterns included. So the Western diet, as you can imagine, had increased consumption of like saturated fats, for instance, and maybe decreased consumption of fruits and vegetables. Balanced diets were those who actually had more so more or less you know, average or homogenous consumption of the different dietary or food types or nutrients. And plant-based diets, as you can guess, includes an increased consumption of fruits and vegetables. So if you look at the radar plot to the right, depicted in blue and green, uh, which corresponds to diets PB1 and PB2 respectively, that there's a significantly increased consumption of fruits, vegetables, and plant proteins when compared with the other dietary patterns. We took this a step further and evaluated its association with the relative odds of active symptoms. So if we were to look at ulcerative colitis, we find that uh, consumption of PB1 or PB2, the plant-based diets, when compared with the Western type diet, was associated with a lower relative odds of active symptoms. When looking at Crohn's disease, we find that diet PB2, again, was associated with a lower relative odds of active symptoms, but very interestingly, that was not the case for diet PB1. Now, we can glean certain, I guess, suggestions from these findings, one being that plant-based diets may actually be helpful for the maintenance or remission in ulcerative, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. But at the same time, not all plant-based diets may be created equally, and there are still some gaps in terms of trying to identify what is helpful for whom. But with this overall body of evidence, 
there are limitations, as I alluded to earlier, but uh, if we were to formally grade the evidence, we'd actually say that they're currently either very low or low. I would at least want to remind the group that lack of research does not mean a lack of effect or benefit. It's just more so that much more research is needed. And let us also remember that we can't handcuff ourselves right now and saying, oh, you know, there's no research data. I can't really provide any recommendations. What we can do at the very least is use and extrapolate from whatever existing data ex are and then try to formulate meaningful recommendations for our patients. So a few clinical takeaways, at least based on the evidence we have thus far. So we could consider exclusive ventral nutrition for Crohn's disease, but I say here for select cases because it does require that disciplined and motivated patient, given that exclusive consumption of liquid nutrition formulas for weeks at a time may be quite challenging. Moreover, and fortunately, if not exclusive ventral nutrition, at least there are solid food alternatives that could be tried, such as the Mediterranean diet, specific carbohydrate diet, and the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And if one were to actually pursue partial enteral nutrition, you can use that with enteral nutrition coupled with one of those aforementioned diets. And then partial enteral nutrition and Crohn's disease exclusion diet may be helpful, at least based on current research literature uh, for the maintenance remission in Crohn's disease. Now, while we may not have as much robust data for ulcerative colitis per se, uh, we could consider a plant-based diet in the meantime, and one of the prototypical diets in that would be the Mediterranean diet. I would like us to also keep in mind that you know, dietary therapy is not to be necessarily viewed as ex mutually exclusive with pharmacologic therapy. Instead, you can view these as complementary strategies in your overall treatment plan. There are some emerging data, albeit you know, single-arm studies at the moment, that have looked at the use of combination therapies, uh, that is, nutritional and pharmacologic therapies, for the induction or remission, and have found there to be what seems to be, when compared with historical controls, an increased efficacy. So could this be also one strategy to break that therapeutic ceiling uh, with our current uh, pharmacologic uh, agents? And as with we do with any of the pharmacologic agents or our pharmacologic approaches, we want to make sure that we define a time frame to assess efficacy. And then we have reasonable treatment targets, such as the control of both symptoms and inflammation using objective markers of efficacy, again, similar to our other traditional strategies, that is, you know, symptoms, CRP, calprotectin, and even you know, endoscopic data, and to continue to monitor for the maintenance of remission after you have achieved your objective of controlling both the symptoms and inflammation.